All right, guys, so today we have a little bit of a different video for you guys. Today we have WWE in 2005, the year of change. Now, me, when I started watching wrestling, it was about mid to late 2011, maybe early 2012. I think it was about mid-2011. I was, like, at my cousin's house, and then he turned on wrestling, and then I was just shocked after. I just couldn't get enough of it. That was regarded as one of the worst eras ever. But for me, I have a lot of nostalgia for it. I love it. Um, but yeah, 2005? Before 2011, I don't really know much. Well, I do know much from like YouTube videos. But like in-depth like of what happened throughout that time, I don't. I'm not the one to ask for that. I'm not a what what Mark or whatever it's called. But today we're going to see what was going on in 2005. Apparently the year changed. I knew this is when Cena was kind of starting to become, you know, the top guy. Uh, I think he debuted in what, 2000? I think it was like 2004 he made his debut. It was 2004, like 2002, something like that. I think it was 2004. But without any further ado, this is by Wrestling Premiere. Guys, first link down in the description of the original video. Go check out the original video. This guy had insane videos. Probably the best wrestling channel out there. It's like documentary style, as we're about to see. This guy's videos are crazy. Go subscribe to him. He's crazy. And if you guys enjoy my reaction to this video, please hit the like button, subscribe, and turn the bell on so you guys do not miss another reaction from me. Yeah, I'm, exci I'm excited to get into this. Um, we're about to see what was going on in 2005, so let's go. After three years of rebuilding, WWE was enjoying the fruits of their labor in 2005. It felt like the future was uncertain after 2002, but not only did it turn out well, it was unlike anything the company had imagined before. From the 2002 perspective, it would be Brock Lesnar leading the charge with everyone. Oh yeah, it was like 2005 or like 2006, one of those years. The roster was fucking stacked. Oh my, like unbelievably stacked. In those three stacked. years, there was a lot of changes. Like oh my Goldberg god. The company after a year, the crash TV style that WWE had tried out on the Attitude Era was left behind in favor of a new era, and best of all, it was the opportunities for the new talent to take. WWE's ratings in 2005 experienced a boost with the pushes of Batista and John Cena, especially yeah. Batista's push in the lead up to WrestleMania 21. It felt like a new this era one was things with were supporting crazy. characters including the likes of Randy Orton, Edge, Roster Wise, and Rey Mysterio, and it was much better than the last two years, which was more reliant on Triple H and an endless push that rarely benefited anyone. It would obviously benefit you tremendously if you beat him like Chris Benoit or Batista did, though. But one thing that's notable. Chris who? I don't know who the fuck the that is. That from the beginning to the end, you knew what you were getting for the most part. And the sense of Batista, Cena, or no one Edge does. Mysterio being Not the future. Person. They never made you doubt that sentiment. Not one bit. <laughs> now you guys know how these I'm reviews stupid. go. Worst to first. Some stuff sprinkled in. Just because something's mentioned early on doesn't mean it was bad, but this is where mostly the bad stuff is. So oh, let's shit. get into it. After many years as WWE's leading commentator, Jim Ross through it all experienced some strange dealings inside and outside the ring. The boss just involved him in bizarre things such as the Kiss My Ass Club. <laughs> WWE decided to move on from the lead voice, despite there being no real reason to. JR was still around in his performances, didn't go decide, but no commentary to JR, by the considered way. Mike Goldberg of the UFC as the lead Michael Cole is a close second. An interesting dynamic because anytime you watch a UFC event from the 2000s and early 10s, he I like Jerry Lawler as well. Was one thing to move on from I JR, think Jerry Lawler is underrated, surgery, which was going to leave him sidelined, but they did this horrible storyline where the McMahons went on a power trip and JR was embarrassed on his way out. Even made a mockery Wait, out what? of the surgery. This led to Stone Cold trying to get his job back. The coach was going to face Austin in his first match back at Taboo Tuesday, and the coach was set to win. And this is where Austin backed out because it was stupid. This in turn, <laughs> it was stupid. Yeah, it sounds like Stone Cold. It didn't resonate much. It was a horrible storyline. With regards to Joey Styles, though, it's not the fact that he was a bad commentator, but for what WWE expected, he wasn't there. But I don't know story, who that is. Worse. One of the worst from the entire year because it was all nonsense. I get they explained wrestlers and characters' absence back then, but this one could have just simply been down to JR leaving to get surgery. It would be the definitive number one if it wasn't for the next storyline, though. Wrestling, wrestling always has to be, like, complicated with everything, dude. I swear to when God. Kurt Angle and Booker T were vying for the WWE Championship. Kurt Angle, though, wanted more than gold. He wanted Booker T's wife. He yeah! 
<laughs> Look at that, that face, bro. No shot. He's behind ball. you. He just suddenly translate all that competitive nature he had into getting her by any means. Already, this was a crazy ass storyline because Kurt Angle was the most gifted wrestler on SmackDown, yet they tried to have him do some nonsense like this. To make matters worse, this guy was shouting that he wants to have sex with her. Anytime oh the camera my was God, like, dude. About her. Vincent is fucking like sex angles, dude. Word, but Vince insisted on it, apparently, according to a couple of people, and barged into a room at one point. It's just terrible, dude. He's beating up Booker T when he randomly just decides, hey, I have a boner and just randomly runs to the back. <laughs> <laughs> he was a proper weirdo at this point, and Angle himself what? considers it to be his worst storyline in WWE. Only in wrestling where one guy can go from having a damn the worst one, Shawn Michaels, to being a sex offender. I hate this storyline because of everything. Like, there's a lot of weird stories you can do. Why this one? Did he I fucking know, power know bomb Angle's a heel. They're trying to get him hated. This is what they were trying to do. Kurt Angle even came racist later on, cursed out the troops, <laughs> but through all of this, even though he's a sex offender and all this, they still cheered him. Tim yeah, this sounds British. like the early 2000s. Yeah. We're out of being a referee. Oh one God. Of the for the WWE throughout his run and was considered a stuff they did by the way i'm sorry for pausing so much it's not gonna happen a lot but stuff they did like i know about the big moments that happened throughout wrestling history of course the stuff they did in the early 2000s and late 1990s dude None of that shit would fly today. Oh my god. Friend by Andre that giant. He was also his age. Holy Sometime shit. The Judgment Day 2002. That uh, Katie Vick shit or they whatever. Oh my god. Yeah, no. Nah. an injury during the Hell in a Cell match. By 2005, he was working backstage. WWE decided to make his disappearance a storyline. Josh Matthews visited the course. Yeah. Barn and his depression was on full display. He even tried to off himself. It was sent to a series on <laughs> WWE.com what? where he would make many attempts to take his life. It was so bad. It's oh my so god. Dumb. What Matthews were they like, smoking? That's not wise. Tim, don't do it. Hang in there. Talk about throwing the letter, shit and at the, the wall. The controversy from this was the fact that it happened a month after Eddie oh, Grail died. Eddie's death God. was a huge Wait, thing. Wait, after or before? The from this was the fact that it happened a month after Eddie Grail died. Bro said like, after. Eddie's death was a huge thing regardless, but unlike Owen Why Hart's death, Why would you death, try he was that? every week at the time, so there was a certain feeling in the months following his passing, especially on SmackDown. It all ended with Tim oh, Lee yeah, finding that's Josh just... so annoying that instead of killing himself, he killed him. It was bizarre, and WWE.com in the years of 2005 and 2006 was filled with strange shows. It was hated and criticized due to the fact that Eddie Guerrero died and all that, but it's under Why the radar because it was that? a WWE.com show, so yeah. The mid-2000s was filled with big guys making their debut Fucking on SmackDown and having a unique finisher. For good and for bad, the guys that were green most likely had a finisher that would stand out, but on I the other side, the wrestler would have a strange gimmick. Matt Morgan was a name on WWE's Holy radar shit. for quite Talk some time. Talk about steroids. He was a company and a member of the OVW roster throughout the years. He even had a run on SmackDown, but WWE thought he was too green and sent him back. Once he came up, he had a stuttering gimmick. Why? I don't know. So they could take him as a, a joke and a threat a at the same time. He came up. He had a stuttering gimmick. Why? I don't know. So they could take him as a joke and a threat at the same time. They weren't helping the wrestlers, and Morgan ended up disappearing again after a couple of months. He'd be like this: I don't, don't, don't have a st stuttering problem. And then he'd destroy some random ass job. He did well for himself in TNA as a blueprint, but WWE didn't seem to wait it out. They wanted him in the future, but it never happened. Who the fuck? This had to be Vince, right? Vince had to come up with that, or some producer. Okay. The card in general had a lot of fire them immediately. Story lines. The dicks was. coming out and spraying each other with water before Who getting pounded. Who thought that would work? The Mexicals were made as a joke. Juan Diego was the name of their lawnmower, and as a kid, anytime I saw a lawnmower, I just think about the Mexicals. Regardless of their gimmick, it was I don't a nice trio of super is. crazy Juventud Guerrero and Psycho. Reminds me of like LWO or something. Osis. Like they're just doing like nothing. Fortunately, they're Juventud just there. made himself an enemy, and what was once a trio brought in to rejuvenate the cruiserweight division was now just around as a duel as the juice was released for disobeying orders and. Hitting a 450 splash during his match with Kid Cash. At this point, he was basically on his way out because he had a lot of heat. Didn't really like the fact that they were paired and were stereotyped. Also, the fact that a lot of wrestlers didn't appreciate the fact that the Mexicals had a good push and he was complaining a lot. I really think WWE messed up from the beginning. I feel like Mexican wrestlers are still stereotyped today. Like, they just do the classic fucking, like, um, oh, get in a group and then fucking um, have all this, uh, what's it called? Uh, have this group and then we're all about family and then we go in a match and we're the underdogs every single time. I'm tired of that, dude. Like, can we get something different? With the Mexicals, Jesus. we remember them, but we don't remember their performances, and that's because they never really got to show it. So they brought them in for no real reason. This was three talented wrestlers, three of the best high-flying wrestlers of the 90s and 2000s, so it's unfortunate to see that they never actually did much. I don't even know the who they are. The division was trash and was a joke Junior's from the beginning. Curl and White is another thing to mention. Chavo Guerrero had grown tired of his Latino heritage and just decides to forego it to become white. He's in the suburbs. <laughs> 
<laughs> to the ring and yelled the saying, if it ain't white, then it ain't right. I actually scrapped the video about him because I ran into a well while making it. So, try to look for the character you know what. If it ain't white, it ain't right. He's in the suburbs, rides the candy to the ring, and you know the saying, if it ain't white, then it ain't right. I actually scrapped the video about him because I ran into a well while making what it. What the so, fuck was they on it, dude? You know it wasn't his choice. I do wonder what would have been of him if Eddie never passed. Oh he actually did a good job with the role and acted delusional thinking he was actually white. His entrance theme song, I listened to it, and it's just so damn good. I don't know why. It shouldn't hit as hard as it does. I oh gaze my upon God. my picket fence, or whatever the hell it is. <laughs> it's a funny gimmick. It's they an ironic gimmick in. as well. They I went think all it was inspired in. by Dave Chappelle's KKK skit, but he did a great job with it. It's kind of stupid, but he did a great job with it. Boogeyman finally made his way to the That wouldn't fly today. It was an entirely bizarre gimmick that easily stood out. The he Boogeyman, really bro. I love the Boogeyman. Man, yo, whenever I saw this dude, I've, I fucking fell in love, you know. Played the role well, and I can't really imagine anyone else as the boogeyman. By dude, the, way, the boogeyman Smith was so good. Gimmick, they should have done more with some it. random jobbers and leave. Jillian Hall, JBL's image consultant, had something on her face, and everyone would just stare at her. It's basically Ew. a mole. And there's plenty of more gimmicks that we'll That's mention disgusting. throughout this video as well. But these are some of the lower card guys. WWE's cruiserweight division didn't really have a strong Mysterio. role on the SmackDown brand as it once did. Rey Mysterio went up to the upper mid card and was about to enter the main event scene. He had surpassed the division. This left the cruiserweight division to be a forgotten part of the show. There was still what, good guys, matches between the what, what was what was Rey Mysterio's prime year? Like what was his like best year ever? I want to know. Likes of Akio and Paul London, any combo of London and Billy Kidman, but the focus was on the division. What are you guys think? What's uh, Rey Mysterio's it was easy best to pair year? These guys and have some good matches because the entire division was talented, and there was even plans for a respected. Or Prime year, the whatever. The likes of the Mexicals, Kid Cash, and even Frankie Kazarian. But John Lawrence and I sabotaged it, and this led to the Juniors division. It was so simple, but they made things hard for themselves. Cruiserweight division. Was Frankie guy Kazarian was WWE. What? Moves, but the wrestlers themselves were somewhat limited because they can't bust out some crazy moves. Even then, they still put in good performances. And on top of that, WWE didn't really care. WWE's tag team division experienced many things throughout the year. On Raw, the tag team championships meant nothing. La Resistance, Hurricane, and Rosie, and Lance Kidd and Trevor Murdoch held the belts, and I can't tell you. A single thing about their title rings because those yeah were... have this has the tag division ever been like good like ever i don't know that i remember it being good the only time i remember it being actually good was when the new day and the usos were having their like big ass feud and like the hell in the cell matches that's that was really good but before or after that I don't. I, I actually just don't recall any. Runs were nothing. It almost felt like they used the tag team division as a part of a tag division. Or never been I like think they great. Were off not even having a tag team to be on Raw because none of those matches stood out or had anything notable about them until Kane and the Big Show teamed up. They instantly made the titles important just by having them on their shoulders. Plus, they were featured a lot towards the end of the year with the SmackDown versus Raw feud. It's better than having the titles only be featured on Heat. SmackDown, on the other hand, <laughs> had a much better idea about what to do with the title. Damn, they Ray really didn't Eddie care Grove for them at one point. But the real highlight throughout the year was Eminem. There wasn't much competition for Tag Team of the Year and WWE for them, but they had great performances, were entertaining heels, and had a funny gimmick. Melina's presence brought a lot to the duo. She carried herself like a huge A-list star, and Eminem shined. Or, they had some uh, decent the matches fuck the year, with the notable one being their Iron Man match against Charlie Haas and Hardcore Holly. It's Melina's just the pairings weren't that interesting, so whenever they'd face a team, it would be a nothing match. LOD was remade with Heidenreich taking Animal's place in the group. It wasn't going to be good. Plus, Heidenreich actually had issues with Animal at the time, and they even had a fight backstage at one point. Eminem was the best team that year was by far. No one was close at all, nor did they put up much of a fight to take that spot. Raw's women's division had a huge... That's not missing. I'm thinking of something else. Miz and Morrison was, uh, they had something else, right? Changed throughout the year of 2000. I'm thinking of something else. Releases and different I'm not in the same world right now. Division a lot. Miley Holly wasn't pushed as much as she once was. They had like WWE a WWE after WrestleMania. Something 21. like that. Victoria was out with an injury. Lita as well, who ended up returning, but as a manager to Edge. And 2005 was carried by Trish Stratus, a woman who was sidelined for five months. And even then, they didn't strip her of the title because nobody was a potential oh, black eye. The there was the option of trying to push someone, but WWE would laugh in your face for mentioning that. This is where somebody like Gil Kim or Jazz would have succeeded, but WWE released him in November of 2004. There was no real face. Of the women's division in the summer of Trisha Way. A Diva Search was the main story, and that competition was horrible. It wasn't as terrible as 2004, so that was an absolute train wreck we'd personally avoid. Here, Ashley Masaro won the competition and ended up having one of those rookie storylines leading to the return Bro, of they didn't give shit sure, about the women's division, let's be honest. Her heel run previously. They were there I for the looks. There nobody that could dethrone her, maybe that's why. But she was clearly the best women's wrestler on Raw. Her heel character was great and had a certain a slut? That's crazy. That was perfect. It's just that run never had a proper ending to it. It was the best decision here. Because they did. 
didn't they care? It was a more seasoned version of Trish Stratus who was about to enter a final run. This trio were not much of a threat as they tried to make them seem at times, but the division would have some much needed talent with the debut of Mickey James. Mickey James ended up being the face of the women's division over the next few years as well. 2006 was much better in that regard because of the fact that while it was once again mostly Trish and Lita, they actually had some stories in there such as the Mickey James one. Kane's unmasking in 2003 led to him becoming unhinged and as oh most dangerous. It had been a long time since Kane was seen as such a huge threat. This will take a hit after WrestleMania. In my personal opinion, I don't know if it's a hot take. I don't think Kane should have ever unmasked, dude. I think he should have kept his original mask. I feel like he would have been as iconic as The Undertaker if they booked him the way they were fucking supposed to. But okay, 20 after okay. he lost to The Undertaker, but he was still out there. They even had a storyline where he, he was more scary than The Undertaker to me when I first saw him. After That's Lita, just me. She ended up carrying his baby. I actually can't believe I said that. It was against her will as well. That's the yeah, story. What the Matt Hardy's fuck? relationship with Lita was once again on TV, and somehow, some way, this all transitioned into a storyline involving Edge. Edge in real life grew a little too close to Lita on the road as Matt Hardy was sidelined. This resulted in plenty of drama from Hardy, who ended up being released. He complained about it, made a big fuss about it, of course, and they released him. This also <laughs> made him very popular with the fans, and WWE had no choice but to respond to the crowds who hijacked Lita's segments. It was also with Edge's segments as well, so they decided to turn Lita heel and make them an on screen couple. Edge had a lot of heat at the time, this only added fuel to the fire as he was basically playing his real self edge and heat go way. hand in Hardy hand was supposed to make appearances with roh but wwe ended up bringing him back just to cook him out of this feud and give edge the upper hand i never got this storyline because wwe fumbled it was supposed to be simple but i guess the moment they gave hardy a microphone and bombed in his first promo they had other plans i'd say it's mostly because <laughs> they're like we're done with guy. this edge was always backed from day one and this wasn't going to change anything especially because he was money in the bank so matt hardy was paid to help edge and that was it he had matt hardy in the slums and heat, which again if you were a wrestler in the 2000s and your name wasn't JBL, The Undertaker, and Triple H, you were going to have it. He had heat because he ran away from a tombstone at Survivor Series from The Undertaker. That's the story that everyone thought, but Hardy corrected it and said it's because he no sold to The Undertaker's appearance. It wasn't supposed was to take the tombstone. Was backstage just crazy? Event, did no one JBL, like each other? I don't know how in the hell he noticed. How did JBL notice? He noticed Hardy feeling like he's above everyone, which was clearly not the case. He made a mistake, obviously, and no selling Undertaker's return. JBL snitched, which led to Taker confronting Hardy and forced an apology out of him. He got this this locker room seems crazy. Got his ass beat at Armageddon by JBL. Got humped or seems violated like you gotta by watch your back. Got his ass beat by Eminem. And it's funny how things ended up formed because it really felt like Hardy had all the momentum upon his return. But they weren't going to push him. He was back because they felt like they wronged him by firing him. And he was just back to put over edge. It was simple as that. Brock Lesnar's departure from WWE in 2004 was a rough one. He basically turned his back on them. There was a lot of bitterness from the company and some of the wrestlers, such as The Big Show. When I say turned his back, I'm talking from their perspective because regardless of Brock's push, it was always his decision to make, and if he felt that way, he should do as he saw fit. Lesnar learned that the no compete clause did he get booed out the building? Really made things tough for him. He always considered besides a run Goldberg Japan, wrestling, which would have when they had well. a match or whatever. Rumors that Brock would return to WWE, but it was going to be awkward, especially for his ego. It's never a good thing to crawl back. Brock was set to potentially return on the SmackDown brand as an opponent for Batista. He was getting paid less than he was previously, but it was still a lot. There was a meeting at the headquarters and it seemed things went well, but it died down and Brock didn't <laughs> what like is that deal. So he went against the contract and went to New Japan. Brock's return would have changed the dynamics of the entire company. I do think almost everyone that won a title later on, such as Orin and Edge would have, but I do wonder what would have happened to someone like Rey Mysterio. Plus, Brock was the final piece of the puzzle for UFC's boom period at the time. It was already going well, but I do wonder how different things would have been in the octagon. Brock felt very upset with the way Vince talked to him and said I don't that nobody keep up has with talked the, to him uh, like that UFC. in his life. He chewed him or whatever it was. Him on, did all kinds of things, and Brock was at a loss for words. So I don't Friday know how Lesnar did. With a lot of realism and controversy. It was the post 9 11 world, and even though it was three years earlier, it still felt like America was in that chapter of the day. Three years earlier is still recent for something like that. Barriers. A Muslim living in constant paranoia. It started off pretty simple, but also forced WWE to go in a more realistic direction and acknowledge the Iraq war and have Hassan show more and more hostility towards the what? Americans. It was gradual, and while he did have some what valid reasons, fuck? he would basically undo it himself by his actions. That Royal Rumble moment. Where they jumped them two brands of hate. Y'all got some balls to do that. To throw him out of the rumble was crazy. As expected, this man had heat in the back because of his push and also because he got goaded into telling Eddie Guerrero to stop using the camel clutch, a move his father created. Other than that, what? his push was getting more and more momentum. He was green, but that character and everything around it was basically gonna push him to the very top. That would all come crashing down after Hassan was implied to be a terrorist by WWE. The episode of what SmackDown was taped two days before the
a London bombing, and once UPN aired the episode on Thursday, he was done. He was banned from SmackDown, and even then cut up tremendous promo on WWE.com. They considered repackaging him, but it was going to be a long time before he'd actually return. That never happened, and he was released. I wonder how different things would have been for Hassan, because he played that role perfectly. I always thought he was an Arab and a Muslim for years. This guy's Italian. I they don't got think balls. it was ever going to end because that type they got of balls. character needed a certain aversion from controversy, and WWE isn't known for that. Hassan's departure from the WWE wasn't the only one that year. WWE cleaned house once again. Luther Reigns, a protege of Kurt Angle and Storyline, asked for his release after creative constantly changed plans. And I don't even know who that is. Being Christian's second problem solved with Tyson Tomko. Other than that, the mid-card was cleared. A lot of names from the 2002 to 2004 era were released. And the most surprising release... From I was the born in 2004. One of the greatest tag teams of all time. It seemed like they were released, but it came down to the duo not coming to... So like I was fucking watching. Contract. They were off TV One for about old. seven months and were down in OVW. SmackDown could have used the Dudley Boys in a feud with Eminem. The division was just so boring and lacked names and any importance. Other than that, there was a couple Dudley of... Dudley Boys go crazy. Those were more on their own terms, which we'll get to later. The mid cartels were in a way better position than the tag titles. The oh, look at that championship. They need to bring this one back. This championship looks so good, man. This was like top three championships of all time in my life. She's actually too. delivered more and had more interest. Oh John Cena was US champion in the beginning of the year, but had outgrown the title. Look and this the top. Orlando Jordan took the title from someone that mattered and did nothing. It contradicts what I said. That title just is wait. just so Jordan's beautiful, just man. Hanging out oh, with my Yale God. Nothing. I can't remember a title match of his that lasted for more than 20 seconds. Chris Benoit's champion, though, was different. We don't talk about him as one of the best U.S. champions for a reason, but from this <gasps> WWE, there was nobody that was a better champion than him. He brought more legitimacy to the U.S. championship, and because he was such a respected name, the title had more attention to it. Booker T challenged for that title and even turned heel to win it with the help of such his wife, Such a good Charmel. championship, They tried to man. do the best of seven years like they did in WCW. W, and it didn't work the same, but the matches weren't bad. They needed a little more to them. It was just not the right time to do the best of seven series. It was much better in WCW. On Raw, Shelton Benjamin had one of the more memorable Intercontinental Championship reigns from that era of WWE. Shelton had incredible athleticism. Shelton and Benjamin was so underrated. He should have been fucking catapulted into stardom, dude. He should have been one of the top guys. This guy, they fumbled the bag, dude. My God, he was ahead of the game with his in-ring skills. About him in 2005, that was special. I think it's because he actually look at that. Go to the very top. The commentary was saying it. Everyone was. Ain't nobody was doing that fucking shit in 2005. Up. Who was the best part of Money in the Bank at WrestleMania? This, My God. this guy was a human highlight reel and was like nobody else. On he should have been a star, bro. They fumbled. Shawn Michaels was his very best, and to this day, it's probably the best match he ever had. HBK is a surprise that entry in the Goldberg tournament. Off, faced a young upstart with all the hunger in the world and a performance that pushed Shawn Michaels. To was very limited. One of the best Raw matches of all time. And to some of you, it was just that. Simple story with Shelton thinking he has it all figured out. It worked for the most part and got him to this very point, but HBK had a few tricks up his sleeve. Oh, that super kick, yeah. The maximum. Something that as good as Shelton was, didn't really have. Unfortunately, the moment Carlito won the title in his Raw debut, his push took a turn and this man had heat. Every time I go back to this era, we hear about someone that has heat. WWE didn't really care much about him and he was left off all the pay-per-views for the most part until he turned heel. He still got that mid-card push later on. The fuck was everyone on in 2000? five dude damn everyone has Carlito, on the other hand was some in a kind very of great heat. position at this point not only was he the intercontinental champion but this man had his own talk show on raw why did carlito shine not only was he a good wrestler he could put in the performances but also had a no pun intended cool character it seemed like the sky was the limit for him at the time chris masters was pushed somewhat similarly in the sense of someone who was seen as a rising star he was pretty good though but had a very impressive i've heard of chris masters i don't know shit about him it's a physique and presentation i really like the masterpiece gimmick it makes him seem much bigger than he's supposed to be he got in a big feud with HBK after SummerSlam, and it was a standout match. HBK really knew how to pull the strings on this one, and Masters managed to earn the trust of Michaels with this performance. He got really better later on in his second run, but he didn't have the same feeling and presentation as he did in 2005. If Masters had the ability of his 2010 self, he would have done much better during this time period. There's always going to be politics to deal with, of course, but he'd have a better chance. Chris Jericho had enjoyed a successful so what happened run in WWE. Over the last six years, Jericho exemplified a world-class ability in the ring and outside, which allowed for him to get to the point he did. Why 2 j had a uniqueness about him, but despite all of this, he never touched the world championship since WrestleMania 18. It was never on Jericho's ability, rather the pecking order, and he fell victim to that. I think Jericho was most deserving of the title during his face run in 2004. Great heel work as well. It seems like a lot of people was. just got By lost in the shuffle. He was burnt out and felt like he needed a change of scenery away from the squared circle. He had one last heel run and put over John Cena before leaving. And Robin people were just getting heat leaving every the fucking week. At all. It was the best time for him to leave because I can't imagine much after a great heel run. He felt almost above the Intercontinental Championship at the time. 
already feuded with John Cena, Triple H, Ric Flair, Shawn Michaels, and that's practically the entire main event scene on Raw. The dynamics weren't really going to be different as they were later on in 2008 and 2009. You know, then he changed his character a lot, and there was a lot that was different with Chris Jericho as opposed to here. Christian, on the other hand, had a different situation. Heading into 2005, Christian had oh, look at Christian, man. character called Captain Charisma. Christian already had the performances in the ring, but almost lacked the seriousness about him. He could get serious and all that, but his best Hide your fathers. star mostly involved comedy. That partnership with Trish Stratus helped a lot and gave him more legitimacy. After WrestleMania, it would begin to show more. Crowds were interested in him, and Christian had a much better relationship with the crowd than WWE expected. He had a great reaction from the crowd in MSG, and that wasn't even the best one. Raw was in Calgary at one point, and he wasn't even wrestling. He just showed up for a segment and had one of the best reactions. He's so the good as a heel, well bro. Him, and Christian even had a short feud with John Cena at one point. They transitioned that into the Y2J storyline, which didn't need to be that. Christian already had storyline problems with John Cena dating back to the Raw Rumble. Then he moved to SmackDown, and his push went nowhere. I get they want to push John Cena, who just won the title. But the I remember like 2012 or like 2011 2012 somewhere in there they like christian he was there but he was more of a face character it was kind of just awkward he was just there i don't think it was weird because there was no real reason to keep christian away from prominent positions batista could have feuded with him at some point as well and he wasn't really around as he once was christian didn't feel important he saw how things were and he's so really much better as a heel bro in october of 2005 christian didn't really have anything bad to say and quickly sided with tna who pushed him as a baby face it was his ear i think in some ways christian could have done a little more here obviously i don't expect him to beat john cena for the title but like I do think it should have been one on one because they had more of a story than Chris Jericho did. Jericho's most likely got a feud with them anyways, but for vengeance, I think it would have been best if it was Christian versus John Cena. 2005 seemed very bright for Randy Orton. At face value, he was a man to face Triple H for the title at WrestleMania. They already had the story down, and Orton even beat Triple H at Survivor Series in an elimination match. Somewhere along the way, the Randy Orton they imagined wasn't there. It was a guy trying to play a role that he wasn't suited for. A part of it comes from the fact that Orton wasn't as cool as he was as a heel, and fans noticed that. He was doing decent in the oh, early Oh, is this funny? He was trying turn, to be a face. Ramp it up as time went on, and there was a much better and believable option in Batista. So I had to go back to what he knew best, the heel role. This came at a great <laughs> time as he was set to feud with The Undertaker. Orn brought up that mean streak back and delivered a good match with The Undertaker at WrestleMania. Orn was going to continue the story but came down with a shoulder injury. It was not the best time, but it also allowed for him to return fresh on the SmackDown brand to continue the feud. This feud brought out the best in The Undertaker as well, who was about to start that best pure striker era. He needed the best opponents, and WWE took notice. But what followed was the best version on The Undertaker. The Undertaker needed this, and it improved his legacy. I think as good as he was before in the character he brought to the company, I think a lot would have been different if the best pure striker Undertaker wasn't around. They had a great feud which centered around Orn's obsession of getting rid of The Undertaker, even burning a casket containing him. Well, Orn was doing all this with his father by his side. It was paced well and culminated... Orton was with a hell in the cell a crazy the man and the feud with the undertaker on top randy Orton's 2005 was a very important one to put him back on track and allowed him to be what he knew best a heel on him he reimagined him and set up a nice couple of years for the dead man Shawn michaels 2005 was certainly a notable one for him he had a great year with plenty of memorable matches and stories what makes 2005 unique though was the fact that he turned heel hbk didn't really take the role of a villain since his return in 2002 there was the nwo thing but nobody really cares with the whole Hogan feud he got to show what he was capable of michaels didn't need to bring all that controversy in his past to be a great heel all he had to do was inflate his ego and that was enough to make him an amazing heel for the summer hbk made a mockery out of hogan inside and outside the ring the problem oh yeah <laughs> that they'll probably never like him there it was short-lived because WWE didn't really want to continue that, but people still talk about it to this very day. Shawn Michaels was back to being a face the next night like nothing happened and feuded with Chris Masters. <laughs> the Hogan story probably needed one like more Like nothing match, happened. But he his way into avoiding a rematch, which would have saw Shawn Michaels most likely scoring the win. Triple H's year in 2005 was a weird one. He wasn't around the title scene after It seems returning. like politics were a really big fucking deal in 2005. Jesus October, Christ. Was basically destroying Ric Flair on a weekly Everyone basis. was coming he for that top spot. Compared to previous years. That feud we're just getting good, what they want. Cooler than previous years. John Cena's push even got the fans to start rooting for him over the baby face and this was a man that was considered to be someone that terrorized the main event scene for three years. I think the common difference between this version of Triple H and the previous one is that because he wasn't in the title scene all the time and was delivering on his performances, it made him look better. And that feud with Ric Flair was great. I really love the storyline, the fact that Ric Flair never won the IC title, overcomes Carlito, but even then Triple H felt that it was a disgrace to see his old friend, his idol, one of the guys he used to look up to as a kid, turn into such a joke. A great story. Rey Mysterio finally managed to move away from the Cruiserweight division after two years. Rey was clearly much higher than the division and had potential to go to the very top. His first feud was with his good friend Eddie Guerrero. Best friends are meant to be Eddie! bitter rivals at their core. Eddie won the tag team titles with Rey, but felt some bitterness over the WrestleMania match which saw Rey constantly adjust his mask and beat Eddie Guerrero. It had the elements of their WCW feud in the action part, but WWE brought more of a personal vibe with this one, and that intensified with each match that Rey won. So 
Eddie revealed that Ray's son Dominic wasn't actually his son. Was this the year? Was this the year of the Infinite Ladder match? His father is Eddie. And it's funny to think that the storyline had a soap opera aspect to it because these guys are mostly pro wrestling through and through. Well, that's what makes it memorable. I always think storylines that are bad with good matches is a strange combination. It's usually the opposite. Eddie was a good heel here. He felt very cold and vicious initially, but noticed that it accomplished nothing because at the end of the day, at his core, it's not about destroying Rey Mysterio. It's about beating him in a wrestling match. So he tried to use other mind games, but even that didn't work. All Eddie had to do to win the match was wrestle, and that's what he learned by the end of the feud inside the steel cage. Rey Mysterio certainly increased his stock with this storyline, but Eddie in particular showed a little more than he did previously. He wasn't the same in ring a bit. He took a hit because of the rough 2004, but he got better as a promo and as a sleazy heel that had all kinds of ways to get to his opponent, whether it's by lying, cheating, or stealing, or psychologically destroying his opponent, or even dishing out a brutal beating. That was what was different about Eddie Guerrero here. While Kurt Angle had his share of strange stories throughout the years, such as becoming a hater of America and siding with Davari, oh Angle was expected God. to find the brightest Jesus. Way to matches. His match with Shawn Michael was a dream match that fulfilled the expectations set by the fans. They had a great story centered around being the best. HBK refused to be outshined, not to mention they really threw anything at the like wall. Doormat, whereas Angle had plenty of respect for him, but he felt that he doesn't deserve to be called the best because in his time away, Angle became just that. WWE saved this one for a while, but when it happened, it was incredible and still holds up well. They had everything you want in a classic match between Angle and Michaels: the WrestleMania setting, the story, and of course the action. I personally think it's the greatest WrestleMania match of all time and one of WWE's very best Whoa. matches ever. It's pro wrestling at its finest. Their sequel is very strong. And while it does give the WrestleMania I don't think I've heard that one before. It didn't top it. Still one of WWE's best matches of 2005, though. Their finale came at WWE Homecoming with a 30 minute Iron Man match. Both men had one win each, and this was supposed to be the tiebreaker. But that wasn't to be, though, as it ended in a draw, leaving things open. Michaels did win the feud, but it lacked a true finale, as their last match happened on Raw in January 2006. I think because these two guys were as good as they were, this I shit happened on Raw? Happened again at WrestleMania 22. And it almost felt like that was the direction before Batista's Motherfucker. injury. Motherfucker! Where's thing our, our Raw fucking. Before Angle became the wrestling. Roman Reigns Angle versus Cody Rhodes matches. In HBK in Chicago. Brand supremacy has been a common theme in WWE stories throughout 2002 to 2005. It was never as intense though as it was in 2005. SmackDown and Raw had too many problems starting with Eric Bischoff's offense to SmackDown having a slot on his Raw show for a match. It developed to become the biggest rivalry in WWE and had to end with a big Survivor Series match. I really like this version of SmackDown versus Raw because it had been building for months. Wrestlers were invading shows and embarrassing said brand and the match ended up delivering with Shawn. Dude, they need to bring this fucking story uh storyline back of like uh, the of like raw invades smackdown smackdown invades raw they need to bring that shit back dude that was so fun Marcus man batista jbl ray mysterio clashing i love yeah, i look for i was i look forward to that every single year because every different year the rosters were like sort of kind of different so you get you get to see like styles clash that you didn't get to see the year previous. A Kurt Angle, Triple H, they need to bring that shit Michaels. back. That would have been insane. But still, it was a great match that gave a proper ending to the storyline and the return of the Undertaker after the match. Unfortunately, tragedy struck the wrestling world on November 13, 2005. Eddie Guerrero shockingly passed away. Eddie's passing stopped. That was the same year. I thought that was 2006. A personal example of somebody who overcame the odds. It was his time, though, and Guerrero's career and life were incomplete. He still had a lot more to accomplish inside and outside the ring. Eddie had just came off a feud with Batista that centered around friendship, and there's something about the fact. Early 2000s seemed like a very fun but very dark time for wrestling the Eddie very dark a time where he reverted to his most prominent character his last match was a representation of his character eddie guerrero left his wife vicky and two young daughters at the age of 38 his death hovered over the wwe for the next few months tribute to fans damn. reporting from all over the world and we all lost a legend for as much that eddie achieved his most important achievement in wrestling was the comeback in 2002 he went no one should go and that young man still managed to become the wwe champion that's Ray just Mysterio sad and Chavo guerrero did who's a in his job prime his name over the next few months and Eddie Guerrero is still missed to this day and his death still affects many. Eddie Guerrero, one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. He had so much left. 2005 was at the end of it, the year of John Cena and Batista. These two are who WWE invested in the most and put over above and beyond. With John Cena, his potential was becoming clear and My clear favorite wrestler ever. to a close. He managed to convince them by the end of the year. Cena's that will never change. His in ring skills, but he had improved a lot and became undeniable. There was nobody more likely to take the title off of JBL. As 2005 rolled around, his star power only increased and provided a huge opening for WWE to make a star. It wasn't a hot shot like Orange, it was more calculated and it got to the point where fans were asking for it. Cena rose to the occasion and was crowned champion at WrestleMania. 
2021. JBL did a tremendous job playing this foil and giving Cena a boost to the top as the rich villain from the streets of New York City. JBL's contributions to Cena's push were huge. They had a great I Quit match at Judgment Day 2005, which was one of Cena's most important performances. And outside the ring, Cena's popularity was increasing, and it got to the point where he released a rap album. It had been a while since WWE saw oh, new stars yeah. emerge with so much ferocity. Like Didn't that Cena. shit go uh, gold or whatever? That album was like the first like a wrestling album ever to go gold i think it was gold or platinum i think it was gold it might have been platinum it's probably gold though Batista did. With the champ though, WWE invested a little more in him moving Cena to Monday night. I didn't think I didn't know return. that album was popping like that. The first half of 2005 was mostly positive. I wouldn't even say mostly, but almost entirely positive. The move to Raw put him under a microscope though, and WWE took away some characteristics Cena had beforehand. There was also a stronger push that resulted in fans realizing that not only was John Cena watered down a bit, but he was portrayed as an underdog despite being the dominant champion. Those first two feuds with Jericho and Angle really changed a lot of the fans' perception of John Cena. Performance wise, he didn't have the same level as he did only a year later so he needed to be guided more in the ring, as opposed to how he usually commands these days. The hate for Cena would increase as time went on, but 2005 was the beginning. It was still a great year for him in the beginning of his dominant run on top. Personally speaking, I preferred 2006 Cena over 05. He felt more comfortable on top, and the performances showed more so. Here, his feud with Kurt Angle wasn't as good as it was in 2003. The when I was watching 2011, 2012, that's when he was like the most hated ever. And I was just a little kid. Yeah! Yeah! Matches were on the level of their SmackDown matches, and his best match was Taboo Tuesday 2005, and that in itself was a match where HBK and Kurt Angle did most of the work. Still a great year for him, but the booking wasn't the best. And when I mean booking, I mean the way they portrayed John Cena after he moved to Raw. I do wonder how different things would have been if he stayed on SmackDown, though. Other than that, he was always going to hold the title for a long time, but number one, they made him seem like an underdog, and number two, fans in general don't really like dominant champions on top. As time goes, yeah, yeah. more, more likely Definitely that fans not. turn on him because he's booked a certain way as for batista i said it before but i thought his tuttering was slightly better throughout 2004 everyone believed randy Orton would take wrestling the fans are just the weirdest fucking creatures that walk this planet they uh complain when someone loses a championship too quick they're like why the fuck would you take it off this guy he was going crazy and then someone like roman reigns who's holding it forever they're like okay we want something else you can't fucking please him, I swear. The spot in the WrestleMania main event against Triple H. He won the belt before it had a story with the game. Orton didn't rest the occasion as a face, and instead it was the animal. Batista was a perfect choice and had a lot of fan support. Even when they teased the split after Survivor Series, the fans went insane. Randy Orton never got a reaction like that as a face. Similar to JBL, Triple H's role as the final boss on Raw only made Batista's push look even better. Dude, especially because they had a- bro, Triple H with like... His hair not oiled. It looks so weird, bro. Mention an evolution. One of the Jesus. best shows WWE had for a WrestleMania match. It was the hottest a wrestler was in about four years. And again, Triple H had a long run on top. But when it came to Batista, he did an amazing job of establishing him. That edit was guy. crazy. He what the fuck? lost three matches in a row to him with the last one being inside Hell in a Cell. It can't get better than that. And that Hell in a Cell match just might be top five for me. They didn't need to leave the cell and do some crazy spots. It was just two men trying to destroy each other. There's something special about Batista coming off of his three matches with Triple H. He felt like he was 99 overall. His move to SmackDown didn't result in the fans turning on him like John Cena because his booking was slightly different. Batista was never portrayed as an underdog. Just that dominant champion was cool. And the Batista you saw throughout 2005 was the same one at the end of it as a post. Have you guys seen Batista nowadays? He looks 70. Oh my god. Cena. The champ drew more though and that's what mattered most. And he WWE. slimmed down. Personally speaking, I like Batista's reign more. They're pushing him hard but not to the point where fans started turning on him. That's what gives him the edge. Plus he had more violent matches, comedy stuff with Eddie Guerrero and even a tag team run with Rey Mysterio. There's more to offer here. Cena's 06 was much better. He had a charm on SmackDown that wasn't used to the maximum on Raw. There was some segments such as the one he called out everyone on the roster or the time he's just walking around in the locker room. Those were two of my favorite segments of his throughout the year. Alright, some bonus stuff we gotta mention throughout 2005. Rhino got fired after WrestleMania for an argument with his wife. They did bring him back. Wait, for what? One night stand, but he was gone afterwards. It's a very unfortunate release for Rhino. It was a slight mistake, and he paid the price for it. They showed no mercy. Viscera had a bizarre ass gimmick. I don't even know what the hell what was the up with fuck? this whole ladies man thing. They would continue to develop it as the year went on, and it got even weirder. Raw moved to USA Network, and SmackDown also moved to Friday nights in September. WWE changed the set design as well. What this were they is before? This set nostalgic to me. It reminds me a lot of SCR 07, as well as that time period itself. Dude! Oh my god, Raw and SmackDown need to bring back unique sets. I don't give a shit about, oh, crowd capacity. We need to make it as small as... No one gives a shit. Make cool fucking sets again, dude. Turn the ring ropes red for Raw. Turn the ring ropes blue for SmackDown. Have unique sets. 
not this. I'm tired of the bland fucking shit. Have you guys heard the SmackDown like intro song too? The uh, Car- who is it? Cardi B, Nicki Minaj. It's one of those people. What the fuck are we doing, dude? Whenever I see the set, it brings oh a lot of good God. memories. Eric Bischoff's run as Raw GM came to a close at the end of the year. They finally ended things and moved on. And it was just a way of changing things, you know? Like, it's not like Eric Bischoff had any heat or problems. They just wanted to move things on and they did a storyline with it. Pay-per-view of the year. This one is simple. It just might be ECW One Night Stand. Of course. I'm going to talk about it much here, but that was a tremendous event. One of the very best pay-per-views of all time. But if you insist, if you want me to choose a WWE event, I'm probably going to choose Vengeance 2005. I'm going to go with Vengeance 2005 over WrestleMania 21. I think all the big batches delivered. They all showed up when it mattered most. Everything delivered. The Hell in a Cell match was one of the best ever as well. Easily pay-per-view of the year for me. Match of the year. This one, you guys are ready. Shawn Michaels versus Kurt Angle, WrestleMania 21. It doesn't get any better than Angle and Michaels on the biggest stage of them all. We already talked about it in great detail during this video, but hey, I just want to mention it as the match of the year. Woman of the year, easily Trish Stratus. I already explained it. Easy. There's no doubt about it that it's Trish Stratus. If we choose anybody else, we're lying. And of course, there's one more award, Wrestler of the Year. Now, if you guys watch the video, you guys know exactly who I'm choosing. If Kurt Angle had a more consistent year in storylines, I probably would have chosen him. I'm not going to lie. I probably would have chosen Kurt Angle for this one. But we're not going to choose him. We're actually going to choose Batista. I choose Batista over John Batista. Cena. Simply due to the fact that his first half of the year was on fire. There was a certain fire that Batista had throughout the first half of the year. That I've no- never watched Batista's Prime. Nobody like, really I wasn't matched. fucking around I don't know. for it. I think it's because of the Triple H thing. Well, I was, but I was like burn. one. Everything about it was special, and he's my pick. I drew oh, yeah. Batista for 2005. He's wrestler of the year. So there it is, WWE 2005. This year was a year of change for WWE. It resulted in a lot of stars being made. I, of course, didn't mention everything here, but we got the basics down. We got a lot of it down. Mm-hmm. Mention mentioned everything. It'll it be two hours. WWE. They changed things. They opened things up, and it was much fresher than usual yeah they had their problems yeah some storylines sucked yeah some under delivered but for the most part it was good you know it was a good year a lot was different here it felt like the future was now that was what it was so yeah all right what'd you guys think of wwe in 2005 please comment down below that's the first video make sure you hit the angle well that video very informative so it seems like 2005 everyone was hungry for the top spot and they'll get people fired for the top spot let's let's not get it twisted the I get everyone had a problem with someone backstage. It seemed uh, th- this seems like one of the most wild years uh, in wrestling history or in WWE history. Uh, everyone had heat. Uh, Cena was coming to the top. Batista was as well. Eddie's gone. Uh, the Benoit situation happened. What two thousand six or seven? Something like that. Crazy early 2000s. It's just, oh my God. It changed wrestling forever. Still leaves an effect today. Uh, There's a line we can't cross. It seemed like before, uh, before the Eddie passing and the Chris Benoit situation, there wasn't really a line whatsoever. But after all that, it kind of opened like, everyone's mind and especially Vince's mind that oh okay there's a line here that we're probably not going to cross ever again with like storylines and what we say which they still kind of still tread on the territories but this video was really good like I said first link down in the description go check out wrestling premiere makes the best fucking wrestling content that's out there if you want to be informed on certain eras or certain wrestlers He's probably got a video on it. And of course, if you guys enjoyed my reaction, please hit the like button, subscribe, and turn the bell on so you guys do not miss another reaction from me. If you guys enjoyed this um, video, I will be checking more out if that's what you guys want. But uh, yeah, without any... uh, What? What was I saying? But yeah, what am I saying? Oh yeah, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I don't know where I was going with that. My name is Freaks. And I'm out. You a fucking bitch. Thinking my shit fucking weak. See what you can do. I bet you can't come close to me. Got the crowd to scream. They screaming out loud.